So it's a fantastic privilege that I have uh, tonight to introduce our speaker. First of all, my name, uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, is Ambrogio Fasoli. I have uh, the honor of directing the Swiss Plasma Center here at the Kefel site. Our speaker is uh, Professor Steve Cowley. Steve is at present the director of the plasma of the Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory in, in the US. Steve received his uh, BA from the University of Oxford in the uh, UK and then his PhD from, uh, from Princeton. And so very early on he had started to travel across the, the pond, across the Atlantic, back and forth. In fact, his uh, postdoctoral work was at, uh, at Callum near Oxford, UK, and then returned to Princeton in 87. He then joined the faculty of uh, the University of California, Los Angeles, in uh, 1993. Became very early a full professor in uh, 2000. For 2001, 2003, he then was again on this side of the Atlantic, and he led the plasma physics group at Imperial College in, in London, where I think he is still a part-time professor, right? I, th very I think so. Very part time. Um, from 2004 to 2008, he was the director of the Center for Multiscale Plasma Dynamics at UCLA. And then, from uh, 2008 to 2016, he was in UK. He was uh, directing the uh, Callan Center for Future Energy, and he was the CEO of the whole United Kingdom Atomic Energy Authority. He was part of uh, the group that uh, reshaped the fusion program in Europe. We are, I was fortunate to be in the same group um, and to form the consortium with which we, we operate now. Uh, he, before going back to the United States again, where he is now, he was also knighted by Queen Elizabeth, so I will refer to him as Sir Steve. <laughs> and, uh, that was for all of his contributions to uh, plasma physics and to fusion uh, energy. As you can imagine, Steve has uh, obtained a number of awards. Uh, we just mentioned that he's a fellow of the Royal Society, the American Physical Society, and the Institute of Physics. And he's a recipient of the IUP's uh, Glazebrook Medal for Leadership in, in Physics. Steve will... Sir, sorry, sir, Steve. You tell us about... <laughs> Seem to find a route to commercial power tonight for fusion energy. It was a great reason you're here tonight. Thank you, Emperor. Thank you. Um, all this changing job sort of indicates I can't hold down a job for too long, so, you know. Um, it's absolutely delightful to be here. In 1920, um, Sir Arthur Stanley Eddington got up at the British Association for the Advancement of Science and said he was the president that year in a big public lecture in Cardiff and he said I'm going to take my topic to be what's the sun made of how does it work Eddington was probably the foremost uh, theoretical astronomer in Britain at the time and was well versed in, in relativity. He had been involved in the measurement of the bending of the starlight around the sun. And he was pondering why it is that the sun is hot. It's the most fundamental property of the sun you probably know of. Um, the, the current theory in, in 1920 dated back to 1860 and Lord Kelvin, who had said that the sun he, he postulated that the sun was simply a gravitationally bound object consisting of gas that was falling in on itself. And as it fell in on itself, released gravitational energy, it got hot, the pressure held up the falling inwards, but as it radiated photons and cooled down, it fell in a little bit further. And each time it fell in a little bit further, released a bit more gravitational energy and radiated a bit more energy every year, and then fell in, fell in, fell in, fell in, fell in to where it is today. And uh, Kelvin then 
being that he was pretty good at calculation, uh, Kelvin estimated the age of the sun and said it's 20 million years old. And um, <clears throat> this was the prevailing theory of what happened inside the sun right up until Eddington's talk in 1920. I'd like to point out that fusion is about 100 years old next year. We'll have a birthday party. Um, <laughs> Eddington then went through a series of evidence. You can see it online, by the way. It was the, the, the talk's published in Nature, so you can actually read the whole talk. It's a superb public lecture, because it's not just a public lecture. He's actually, for the first time, really laying out the modern theory of what the sun is. And he said, look, there's, a, there's all these reasons that it cannot be 20 million years old, the sun. By the way, Darwin was pretty upset in Kelvin's argument that it was 20 million years old. Darwin had estimated the age of uh, the Weald in Kent to be 300 million years old. And so he was a bit upset that the age of the sun was 20 million years old, but Kent was 300 million years old, and they obviously couldn't be true. But even at that time, this was not enough to dissuade people on, this, on, on Kelvin's theory. But in 1920, it just became obvious that it couldn't be true, that it was 20 million years old. So if it's not 20 million years old, then there must be something that keeps the sun hot, because it keeps radiating energy away, and we know its luminosity, and we can calculate how much energy is lost per year, and that something must be replacing that energy, otherwise the sun would fall in still further. And, um, and Eddington was lucky. Now, look, it's good to be smart in physics, but it's also good to be lucky, right? So uh, I wish you luck. Um, uh, Francis Aston had perfected the uh, mass spectrometer, um, really, in, in the year before this lecture. And he had measured very precisely the masses of hydrogen and the masses of helium. And so Eddington conjectures. He says, look, four hydrogens making one helium, there's a little bit too much mass in the hydrogens. And so the effect of turning four hydrogens into helium is the loss of mass. Of course, he was not sure what the nucleus was made of. I mean, this is 1920. We don't even know that there's a neutron at this point, and we don't really know the constituents of the neutron. But he, he, he conjectured that somehow you captured electrons on, on these hydrogen, and you put four hydrogen together, and you make helium. And now the great thing, of course, is that you know, he knew E equals mc squared, and he could calculate how much energy was liberated in making f four hydrogens into helium without understanding at all how that happened. Right? And it's, we, we, we give this as an exercise to students in uh, early nuclear physics courses. Um, and then he said, well, you know, supposing the sun converts one-third of its mass from hydrogen to helium. And, of course, he knew there was hydrogen and helium in the sun from the spectra of the, of the sun's chromosphere. Um, he said, supposing it converts one-third of its mass from hydrogen to helium, what kind of lifetime would that be? And that's 10 billion years. It's not a bad estimate, just for a back-of-the-envelope estimate. Uh, what I like about this lecture is that he didn't have to do much fancy mathematics. He just had to make a reasonable assumption of what was going on, and he could say a lot about the structure of the sun. Um, hundred years. The problem of giving talks about fusion is there's always somebody in the audience who say, oh, I know the joke about fusion. It's 30 years away and always will be. <laughs> Well, then it was 100 years away. I'm not sure it's in our favor. Um, I like to start talks in this way. I always say talks like a James Bond movie. You know, at the beginning of all James Bond movies, there's a bit before you see the introduction and the credits. Um, he's on top of a train. It's going into a tunnel. He's fighting the villain, etc. And so you've just seen that bit of the talk. Now we get to the introduction. Um, <laughs> We're about, we're just over five years away from the beginning of ITER, the International Tokamak, and that phase of fusion where we are looking to make 
what we call burning plasmas. I'll explain in a moment what a burning plasma is. And by the way, for those who are experts in fusion, this talk is aimed at the graduate students, not necessarily in plasma physics. So uh, excuse me if I explain um, some of the simple things. Um, we're about five years away from doing burning plasmas in ITER. And the question is, you know, when will we do commercial fusion? And I always say that I think we know how to do fusion, but we don't really yet know how to do fusion at a cost the consumer wants to pay for their electricity. Producing something that will compete with renewables now that are coming down in cost, very, very pleasingly coming down in cost, and um, supply to the market in a reliable way and at a cost the consumer wants to pay is really a much bigger challenge than just getting fusion. Um, and the US has, has brought on um, that question with a National Academy review that reported last December and has had a huge influence on the direction of the US fusion program. And I'll explain why that is changing. People are asking the question, look, we could do fusion on, on ITER, and that's going to be a spectacular experiment, but how do we bring down the cost, make it more efficient, make it into something that can actually deliver energy 24-7, and something that, um, you know, that uh, utilities, particularly in the United States, are willing to pay for? It is not sufficient to say we can do fusion in 10 gigawatt power stations, you know, 10 times the size of a normal uh, power station, uh, because in the US market, it's all private, and there are no companies that would ever be able to afford the investment cost on a 10 gigawatt power station. So to come to market in the US context really means bringing down the scale of the eventual reactors, um, as well as the cost. So I'll talk about what sets the cost. I'll talk about what the, the National Academy of Sciences report talked about because we're talking about making pilot plants. Pilot plant is something that makes some electricity, maybe not very much, but just a little amount of electricity from fusion. Um, and I'll talk about what innovation is needed there. I'll talk about some of the progress that we're seeing with some of the more advanced configurations, uh, which we call stellarators, and I'll talk about what that is, um, and why I have some optimism about that route. Um, and then uh, I'll talk about what's needed to have radical simplification of what we're doing. So you can do many fusion reactions. Um, and of all the fusion reactions, that's w there's one whose cross-section is 100 times less than uh, the cross-section of all other fusion reactions. If you were just starting from scratch and saying, what fusion reactions are the ones most likely to be easy to do, you've got to remember what the physics is behind this. right? To get fusion to happen, you've got to get two nuclei close enough that the strong force will pull them together. But that means overcoming the Coulomb repulsion, the electrostatic repulsion of, of the two positively charged nuclei. So you want to start with um, hydrogen. You want to start with singly charged nuclei because they have the least repulsion to get together. But of all the hydrogen fusion reactions that you can do, the one between deuterium, which is heavy hydrogen, which is proton and, and a neutron, and tritium, which is super heavy hydrogen, which is proton and two neutrons, at this point in this talk, I usually say to people, protons are colored green, neutrons are colored blue, but not in reality. Um, <laughs> if you can bring deuterium and tritium uh, close enough that the strong force will, will act, it's uh, a little more than 10 to the minus 14 meters, right? For an instant, you will create helium-5. And the reason this reaction is the easiest fusion reaction to do is because you create um, helium-5 and an excited state of helium-5 at 104 kilovolts. It's the J3 halved state of, of uh, helium-5. And for an instant, you form helium-5, but it's unstable. And it decays. It decays into helium-4, the most common form of helium, and a neutron. And the helium and the neutron have a lot of kinetic energy. In fact, the neutron out of, out of fusion, out of deuterium-tritium fusion, is one of the most energetic 
neutrons in all of nuclear physics. It's 14 MeV neutron as opposed to 1 to 2 MeV neutrons that you get out of fission. Um, the helium nucleus is charged, and uh, we'll get to why that's important in, the mo in a moment. So this is, the, this is the reaction that everybody but a few bonkers companies in California are trying to do. Um, there are people in California trying to do the fusion of proton and boron-11 to make three alpha particles. Um, it's a lovely reaction, only this one goes at about a temperature of 40 kilovolts, and that one goes at a temperature of 450 kilovolts. Um, so since this one is hard enough to do, almost everybody in fusion wants to do this um, reaction. So deuterium tritium goes to helium, goes to, goes to a neutron, um, and they come out with all this kinetic energy. Tritium does not exist in nature. It has a half-life of 12.4 years, and therefore you have to make it. And so any fusion reaction system has to take that neutron and bombard lithium, in this case lithium-6, which is 7.3% of uh, naturally occurring lithium, and split the lithium into tritium and helium, and you get a little extra energy out of that too. Um, you then take that tritium, you feed it back into your system, and uh, uh, so tritium is an intermediary, not a fuel. Now, of course, in order to get this to happen, you have to have, you have to ram the deuterium and tritium together with center of mass energies, you know, in the 40, 50 kilovolt range. At that um, center of mass energy is enough to get you close enough that the quantum tunneling into this J3 half state of, of uh, helium-5 uh, carries you the rest of the way. Um, so you've got to be ramming them together with this kind of center of mass energy. And the way we get that is, is we heat up the deuterium and tritium to temperatures of order 20 to 30 kilovolts, uh, 200 to 300 million degrees Celsius. And then they're running around, and they run into each other. Most of the time, they glance off each other, of course. But when they, when they hit almost smack on with enough energy, then you will get the fusion reactions to happen, and you'll release the um, alpha particle, the helium nucleus, and the neutron. Um, so this reaction actually was known before the Second World War. It was Mark Oliphant in, in Rutherford's lab who first uh, saw this reaction actually happening. Um, we've done this reaction. There's some people out there who say, well, you know, how can you get a sun in a bottle? In the 1990s, um, two machines... Oh, I should make this point before we get there. Um, in order to get that to happen, you've got to have a plasma at a temperature of about 200 million degrees. And that's the fusion reaction. Um, you get most of the energy out, four-fifths of the energy, comes out as the neutron, and that goes into the wall where you have what we call a breeding blanket, which has your lithium, and that's typically at a temperature of something like 600 degrees. The reason we're very keen to do fusion is there's about 30 million years worth of lithium in seawater and about 60 billion years worth of deuterium in seawater. And so the supply is terrifically good. And the byproduct is helium, and in principle you could blow up birthday balloons um, <laughs> with the waste, but it's a bit more complicated than that. Um, so we did this reaction in two devices in the 1990s. Um, this is uh, at uh, Princeton Plasma Physics Lab, where, where I am now. Um, this is uh, the Tokamak Fusion Test Reactor, TFTR, which in uh, 1994, here we are, the time trace over here, um, did about a second's worth of just over 10 megawatts of fusion power coming out of the machine. At the time, over 30 megawatts of heating power was going into the plasma, external heating power, to keep it hot enough to make it produce that 10 megawatts of power. Um, the shot that almost everybody talks about was on JET at Cullum. This is a picture of the inside of JET. Here you can see the plasma hitting the wall, where you can see it emitting light. In the middle, where it's really hot, it doesn't emit in the visible, so the really hot bits don't glow. Um, but JET, in 1997, did, um, for 
one and a half seconds, about 16 megawatts of fusion power. But to be honest, that shot is not what we're pinning our future hopes on because it went up to 16 megawatts and then um, uh, abruptly terminated the shot. Um, the, one, the typical one that um, ITER, for instance, extrapolations are made on is the red line on there where you take it up, hold it at about four to five uh, megawatts of fusion power and then bring it down at the end of the shot. Um, this was a demonstration that you can get those kind of temperatures. I mean, the, the temperatures that were achieved on JET and on TFDR went up into the 30 to 40 kilovolt range. And in fact, I think the, the maximum temperature achieved on TFTR was almost 50 kilovolts um, iron temperature, um, showing that you could actually contain a plasma at these amazing temperatures, I think, was a great step forward. But the thing about these, um, these experiments is that we were pouring in energy to keep the plasma hot. This was a serious amount of heating going in. And um, uh, we wanted to go to the next stage. And in some sense, uh, for both Cullum and for <laughs> Princeton, we pushed ourselves out of the business by making, these, uh, by making these experiments because the next stage had to be uh, a sizably bigger machine. And this was the building of ITER. Um, ITER, I will get to its performance in the... Sorry, next one. Uh, ITER, here's a picture of ITER from the air. I like the nighttime pictures. It just looks cooler, right? <laughs> um, but it's a picture of ETA from the air. The, the, the Taurus will sit right here. Uh, the assembly building's behind it. Um, a, an amazing amount of technology has to get together in order to make this machine happen. Here is a CAD picture of what it is. Of course, it's a, it's a plasma in the shape of a Taurus, a donut, carrying about 15 million of amps around the loop. Now, the simple thing about magnetic confinement, and I'm not going to go into magnetic confinement uh, in great details, is the way the plasma holds itself together in this case is by the attraction of like currents. You have 50, 15 million amps flowing in this great wadge of plasma around the loop, and the current on one side is attracting the current on the other side, and it pinches itself off the walls, and that's how it holds the pressure of the plasma that's pushing out from the middle to the edge. The plasma pressure in the middle is about seven atmospheres of pressure, and it, that's a, a, a fraction of a gram of plasma at se producing seven atmospheres of pressure because a typical temperature will be about 25 kilovolts. Um, and if, so if we go to actual performance, what ITER is supposed to do, the pink bit there is where the plasma is. Um, here is a standard European person. Um, I think we get to do that because it's in Europe. Um, and uh, the, the, this is held together by these niobium tin uh, superconducting coils that make essentially a toroidal solenoid around that. Those niobium tin uh, superconductors produce a field in the middle of the plasma of about five tesla, and a field, this will be important for when I talk about advances later on, of about 11.8 tesla right on the inside of the coil. This is about the limit of niobium tin technology um, at this point, at this scale. Uh, we may be able to uh, push niobium tin up a bit, but this is about as big a field as you can get out of that. Um, the center of this is supposed to get up to the plasma temperature of about, as I said before, about 23, 25 kilovolts of temperature, at which point we're expecting about 500 megawatts of fusion power. 500 megawatts of fusion power, four-fifths comes out as the neutron, so 400 megawatts of neutron power, and 100 megawatts of alpha power in the helium nuclei. Now, the helium nuclei is charged, so it stays in the plasma, and it's moving extraordinarily fast. And as it goes through the plasma, it bumps into the deuterium and tritium, giving up its energy, slowing down on the plasma, and can heat the plasma. This is the self-heating of a fusion plasma. The goal of ITER, really, is to see that we can replace the losses of the heat from the plasma by the self-heating from fusion. This 
Helium nucleus giving up its energy to the plasma is the self-heating. We quantify the loss of energy from the plasma by something called the energy confinement time. It's really just an empirical parameter that tells you roughly the time it takes for energy to get from the middle of the plasma to the edge of the plasma. Because that process of heat leaving the plasma happens by turbulent convection of lots of little uh, turbulent cells that move hot plasma out, cold plasma in, hot plasma out, cold plasma in, all the way from the middle to the edge. And it's a very complicated process. So for, to just quantify that process, we put down this time that you need to, uh, to have for the energy to go from the middle to the edge. That time on jet is just under a second at the very top performance of jet. On ETA, it has to reach about four, four seconds in order to be able to balance the, uh, the uh, self-heating of the plasma. So what I'm going to do is take you through what would happen in a shot on, e on ETA. Um, this is based on um, a series of um, simulations with a code that takes input from partly empirical input on the way things scale inside plasmas that we know, like JET, um, and also partly from models we have of how things behave. So it's a sort of simulation of simulations, really. And this one was done by Bob Budney a couple of years ago. Um, uh, he's a physicist at Princeton. So at the beginning of an e ETA shot, you've got this empty torus with a magnetic field of a bit over five tesla going around the loop. The first thing you do is you puff in a 50% mixture of deuterium and tritium. Then what you do in that torus is you change the magnetic flux through the hole in the donut and you induce a voltage around the loop. And you drive a current of about 15 million amps. So that's here. Um, and that 15 million amps heats up the plasma to of order a few kilovolts of temperature. That's not sufficient to start any kind of uh, fusion. At this point in time here, you turn on the heating that will be applied to ITER. This is in the, uh, a mixture of microwave heating, which uh, heats the electrons spiraling around the field lines, and uh, neutral beams, beams of neutralized particles that slam into the plasma. It doesn't matter what the heating is so much right now. Uh, 70 megawatts of heating power, and the central temperature shoots up. Now, what Budney did here is he looked at variations in the model. So the model that he prefers, it's admittedly one of the more optimistic ones, is scan 2, the blue line. Um, so when you turn on 70 megawatts of power, the central temperature shoots up, in this case, to about 23 kilovolts on the blue line. You start to see fusion power, just over 500 megawatts of fusion power on the right-hand side here. And you see these internal oscillations. Those are what we call sawtooth oscillations in the middle of the plasma, which are modulating the fusion power. Then at this time here, the external heating is turned down to 50 megawatts of power, and it still keeps going. And at this time here, you turn it off, the external heating power. And at that point, you will see that the blue line keeps giving fusion power, and it keeps going out. Because it's about 500 megawatts of power, and the self-heating is 100 megawatts of power, and that's sufficient to cause it to sustain itself. This would be called ignition in, in ITER, and ITER has not promised ignition, but it's possible it will get there. Um, what's rather worrying about ITER, of course, is if you vary the boundary conditions by small amounts, you can go to scan one, which would not show anything like the same sustainment, and when you turn off the external power, it would go out completely. And even scan four, scan four is where you stop the diffusion of the helium nuclei after they slow down by slamming in to the deuterium and tritium and giving up their energy, you want to get them out of your fusion reactor because they're the ash. And they will clog up your fusion reactor with, with helium, which doesn't react, and your fuel will be diluted and you won't get fusion to sustain itself. So this is what ITER is going to do. 
And honestly, if it does anything like this, it will be one of the most spectacular experiments we've ever seen. Right? But it's not a demonstration of commercial fusion power. You're probably well aware, as I am, that ITER is costing a lot of money. Um, maybe 20 billion euro, something like that. It's one of the most expensive experiments ever. But it will do something extraordinarily spectacular, and it will demonstrate a self-sustained fusion burn, and I hope it does before I quit this planet, um, <laughs> because I'd like to be there. Um, I think this would be a, a spectacular. But in the US, this is not necessarily as celebrated, perhaps, as it should be. Um, and so the National Academy was asked to look at two questions for the US fusion program. The first question is, should the US remain in ITER? Right? It, it keeps going in and coming out, going in and coming out. Um, uh, these are um, issues. And the second question is, what else should it do? As well as ITER, what else should it do? The US just has no ambition at the national level to produce fusion power. It, the fusion program in the United States is a science program and has no goal of actually making any fusion power. So the National Academy about two years ago got together a group of distinguished people, some of them from plasma physics and fusion, some of them from other areas of physics, to look at these two questions. And they came out with what I think is a very clear report. They said, the first, they said there are really just two recommendations from this report. And if you rewrite reports for government, and I've done rather too many of them, um, having just two conclusions is about the maximum you want. Um, the attention span of governments is rather short. And if you can just get them to focus on two things, that's great. Um, so the first one was that the United States should remain in ITER. And they said something very important. They said, if the United States were not in ITER, they would have to do ITER. Because any route to fusion energy has to produce a burning plasma. And this is the most likely way we can make a burning plasma in our lifetime. So get on with it and do it. And that was a very welcome conclusion, as far as I was concerned. The second is a, is a sea change for the United States. And this is what, mostly what this talk is about, although I've talked a lot already. Um, it, they said uh, the United States should have a goal of producing a pilot plant that would produce net fusion electricity. Um, and they didn't put in, the in, the, uh, in this recommendation exactly on what time scale, but later in their report, they indicate in the 2040s. So this would be a machine all they require of it is it produces net electricity. It doesn't have to produce a lot of electricity, and it doesn't have to produce electricity at uh, the cost of electricity at something competitive. But they want the lowest possible capital cost. Now, this brings up the question, right? Can we actually reduce costs from ITER? And in Europe, we have plans for a demo reactor which is really based on the whole ITER concept. Are there technologies that will reduce the cost of fusion to a more manageable scale? Um, and there is a lot of optimism in, this, in the States for a couple of innovations, and that's what I'm going to focus on for the last part of this talk. Okay. Um, uh, it goes under the rubric, smaller, faster, cheaper. Uh, in the 1990s, NASA had a had a call for smaller, faster, cheaper rockets. And in the end, they decided you could do two of the three, but not all three. Um, so actually, um, I'm beginning to wonder whether smaller is really cheaper, but we'll get to that. Um, if you look at the cost of, so what do physicists do when they look at cost? You can, you can look at the cost of individual components. But actually, the cost of building most of these things is not in the individual components. It's not in the cost of concrete, uh, steel, copper, niobium tin, anything else like that. It's in the cost of doing the engineering. And so a, a bunch of people have scaled the cost of various experiments and fitted it to a formula like this. This is probably highly misleading, right? Because the cost of what we want to do really does depend on the cost of doing things like negotiating with the nuclear regulator, um, all the things that eaters had to 
had to uh, look at. But it's very difficult to answer the question that the National Academy puts up, which is how do we go for a low-cost pilot plant without sort of considering that it must scale somehow with size and it must scale somehow with magnetic field. So R is the sort of mean major radius of the, of the device, and B is the size of the magnetic field. What we do know is that 60% of the cost uh, in existing experiments comes from the making the magnetic field, the coils, from the power supplies, from the cryogenic system that cools the superconducting coils, from these kind of things. So let's just take a step back and do a little bit of, of the physics behind this and ask ourselves, you know, what we think determines magnetic field and size and therefore in some sense affects the cost. All right. Um, if, you, if you look at uh, the power from fusion, the, the fusion power density, this is a, a formula that anybody in the business needs to re remember, is basically, uh, it's, it's nearly a tenth times the pressure of the plasma squared in atmospheres in megawatts per meter cubed. It's a nice handy dandy formula. It fits the data between about 10 kilovolts and about 25 kilovolts. Um, where we normally op operate. But so that's the fusion power density. And of course, you want to make fusion power density in order to make fusion happen. So, um, but we can find with a magnetic field. And the pressure in a magnetic field, uh, another handy dandy formula, is basically four times B squared, where the magnetic field is in Tesla in atmospheres. So you can combine this with something that comes out of plasma physics. The magnetic field has to hold the plasma in place against the pressure of the plasma. And you can't raise the pressure of the plasma above a certain limit, which is set by the magnetic field strength that you can produce out of your coils. So this figure of merit beta is one of the very few basic things that you want to maximize in any fusion configuration. So beta is, a, is, is an important number. And in most plasmas, you can't get it above a few percent, although some of the more modern ones may be, may be 20 percent, that kind of thing. Um, but it's a fixed number between devices that are self-similar, if you like, in shape. And remember, eta is basically jet times two, so it's self-similar with the device we currently have. So the power and fusion is given by this formula, again in megawatts per meter squared, but it's the b to the fourth here. And so for many years, people have said, what we really need to do is to be able to build machines with stronger magnetic fields. Double the magnetic field, 16 times the power density are coming out of fusion. That's a pretty large lever in order to make things easier. Um, and high field machines is sort of a specialty of um, MIT. MIT has built high field copper machines for some years. Alcator at MIT was, I think, um, ran at six, seven, eight Tesla, um, which is much higher than a jet at sort of three, three-ish Tesla. Um, so the other thing you need to know in terms of physics is how does that heat get lost from the plasma? How, did, how does the turbulence bring the heat out? And here I'm going to use, again, a back-of-the-envelope argument, although there's some beautiful simulations now, that, um, especially actually from the group here. Um, on, on actually simulating the turbulence that goes on inside the plasma. It's one of the great steps forward in the last 10 to 15 years that we can actually calculate plasma turbulence. Here's a picture from General Atomics, from the gyro code at General Atomics, of a simulation of the turbulent bubbling. The middle of the plasma is hot, the edge is cold, and these instabilities cause this turbulence in there. And what you need to know about these instabilities is the typical size of these eddies is about an iron arm or radius, the radius that an iron goes around a field line. And in order to get from the middle to the edge, you have to take random steps going around an eddy, then maybe back in again, then back out on an eddy, going round, in order to work the heat from the middle to the edge. So it's essentially a random walk that the turbulence produces of heat from the middle to the edge. And so the distance you go, which is typically I don't know, uh, some factor times the major radius, is the square root of the number of steps times the step size, which is the lama radius. OK, so the number of steps is given by that formula on the top right-hand side. And for eta, the number of turbulent steps 
you take to go from the middle to the outside of the plasma will be about a million. Um, now, you take a turbulent step in the eddy turnover time of one of those turbulent eddies. And essentially, these eddies are sound waves. And the sound wave has a typical frequency and time scale, which is the time scale to go along a field line, see how they're elongated along the field line, once around the machine. I'm not going to prove that to you. I'm just going to state it. Um, and so the time scale is basically the size of the machine divided by the thermal velocity of a typical ion. Um, and we know all these quantities. So the energy confinement time is the number of steps times the eddy turnover time. And that scales like B squared times R cubed. And this is the temperature to the minus 3 halves power. The temperature has to be in the fusion range. And between devices, it doesn't range, change very much over the, uh, for a fusion devices. So we'll just t treat that as a constant. Now, so we've got the elements we need. We've got the fusion power proportional to B to the fourth. And we've got the loss of energy in the energy confinement time. And we can equate the energy input from the helium nuclei slowing down in the plasma with a loss. And this is what you'd call the self-heated regime, the ignited regime. And when you put that together with those formula that I just gave you, it says in order to be able to be self-heated, b to the fourth times r cubed has to be bigger than some number. And sure enough, if you look at different things that have been proposed, eta, r is 6.2 meters, b is 5.3 meters, this product b times r to the three quarters, the one quarter power of that is about 20. And MIT have just come forward and said, we think using high temperature superconductors, we can take the field in one of these devices, not at 5 Tesla, but 12.5 Tesla in the middle of the machine. This is a machine called Spark that they've just raised $150 million of venture capital money in order to build. Um, in order to make this happen, they have to build large toroidal field coils out of high temperature superconductors. And they're working on that at the moment. It's a pretty exciting project. It's a bit risky, but it's exciting. Um, and the size of that device, in order to re reach the same kind of parameters, is 1.78 meters. And sure enough, if you take that times B times R to the three quarters, that gives you 19.2. And you go around all the machines people have proposed, and this is roughly um, a true. Real designs do a lot better than this. Don't imagine that the fusion community bases on this kind of simple scaling argument, but I'm just giving you how things really depend. So if we could go to very high fields, maybe we could make fusion reactors um, uh, happen much quicker. And this is what motivated the, the National Academy of Sciences. Here's a picture of the Korean demonstration reactor that they're aiming to get online by about 2040. Um, and this is a picture of a conception from Princeton, from John Menard and Tom Brown at, at Princeton, of a pilot plant that would produce almost identical performance. Um, and you can see the difference in size. These, I think, are American-sized people um, right here. And uh, I'm not going to say whether that's bigger or smaller. That would be, I could get in trouble back home. Um, <laughs> Um, and, and MIT devices is, is, is very similar in size. But the amazing thing about this is, look, if you've got 12.5 um, you know, tesla in the middle of the plasma, on the coil on the inside, you've got 25 tesla. Go back to my formula for the pressure in the magnetic field. And this will be a force on the coil, pressure force on the coil. It's equivalent to a pressure of 2,500 atmospheres of pressure. Now, to put that in context, the bottom of the Marianas Trench in the middle of the Pacific Ocean is 1,000 atmospheres of pressure. So this is 2.5 times the pressure at the bottom of the deepest part of the Pacific Ocean. That's a lot of force. Right? So there is a downside to going to these very high fields. And that is we've got to be able to make magnets that can survive that force. And the challenge at the moment, both at um, at MIT and some of the work we're doing at Princeton is to find ways to make a superconducting magnet, which you know, has this high temperature superconducting ceramic stuff with forces on it of this order and make sure that it doesn't explode. Um, and I think if we can do that, 
it'll be very interesting. But is this the only way to bring down the cost? The only way being to shrink the size of the thing by making the magnetic field this immense size. I have some problems with this in terms of the problems it produces for the rest of the plasma physics. The concentration of power is immense, and the exhaust system from this, which we call the diverter, will have a power density roughly uh, 15 times that of the ETA exhaust de density, which is already a bit challenging. Um, and so these devices will have to come up with diverter solutions, which is what TCV has been working on, um, that are much more sophisticated than the ones we're looking at. But that's the challenge, right? We want to bring down the cost and scale of fusion. We've got to develop these kind of technologies. Another issue at these fields is if the plasma disrupts, sometimes plasmas throw themselves against the wall, if the plasma disrupts, the power density in these plasmas is so large that the damage to the wall will be much larger even than is, is in, in ITER. Um, so we have a big challenge there. I'm asking the question uh, at Princeton, and we're looking into this, is, is there a way to actually go to low power density and reduce the cost? Because the cost is so associated with the, the magnets, et cetera, maybe what we need to do is to look for simplifications on the magnets. Um, and also, in this time, we've seen from the... German program, the first results from a machine called Wendelstein, um, here's a picture of Wendelstein, which is a three-dimensional machine um, which has a plasma configuration like this, where they're starting to get performance that's as good as a tokamak. But this machine doesn't carry a net current, so it doesn't have the disruptive instabilities. This machine is intrinsically steady state, um, and the confinement is beginning to be uh, uh, comparable to tokamaks. Now, the advantage of this machine is we don't have to produce pulsed fields. We only have to produce steady state fields. But we have to produce these amazingly complicated coils that make this three-dimensional structure. You have to twist the magnetic field lines with the coils rather than with the current in the plasma. And it's rather hard to do. And if this picture is an example of this absolutely superb but enormously difficult engineering that they had to go through to make uh, Wendelstein work. The, the, the coils, superconducting coils are over here. They're inside a cryostat, and then the plasma's inside that. But the results are very tempting. And it's only starting to sort of touch the surface of what you might be able to do with three-dimensional fields. Um, it's run, I think, for about a year and a half, and it's down at the moment for some upgrades, and then it'll come back. And my anticipation is we'll see this machine get results that are as good as, as tokamaks in terms of confinement. And then the question is, can you make these complicated structures in a simple way? Could you find engineering solutions that will allow you to make machines like this, but very simply? Um, there, there's a whole bunch of ways, I don't have time really for this, different configurations that you might make, but the difficulty is finding ones in which the intrinsically particles stay inside the plasma and don't just wander out. Because it's three dimensions, and um, generically, the orbits of particles will, will, will be stochastic. And what you have to do is, is design the field, and the Germans took about 10 years to design Wendelstein's field on supercomputers, by optimizing and optimizing and optimizing until a particle orbit stayed inside the machine with a great deal of accuracy. And now, they find that their confinement is not defined by the particle orbits, but by the turbulence inside the machine as it is in tokamaks. So they're starting to see very similar behavior to what we saw in tokamaks in the 1990s. Um, and I need to move through this. This is some of their performance, but I'm not going to go into it. I think it's promising. We're not quite there yet. Um, and there's a whole new set of possible, sorry, keep going. There's a whole new set of possible configurations, this one here, in which while the field, the field doesn't have any intrinsic symmetry in itself, to the particles, the field has what we call a quasi-symmetry. This is the theorem due to Alan Boozer um, in 1983, in which he pointed out that for particle orbits, what has to have symmetry is the, is the magnetic field strength on one of these flux surfaces. And if you could have symmetry in that, 
then you could confine the particles absolutely um, in their orbits. And nobody's tried these configurations. And I think they're worth trying because they lead to a much simpler and a more effective, um, uh, we're moving on. One of the advantages of stellarators, since they don't have to drive the current, is that when we look at a pilot plant made from a stellarator, for the same size pilot plant, we make electricity with a stellarator, but we don't with a tokamak, because the tokamak has to use some of its electricity to drive the current. And because it's, it has what we call recycling power to drive the current, this is going to be a problem. So when I got to Princeton last year, oh dear, got to Princeton last year, one of the things we started to look at was how to simplify stellarators. Making a cost-effective fusion reactor with coils that are that complicated is going to be really hard to do. So can we simplify the engineering and actually go for something much, much cheaper? Well, this is an intriguing possibility. We don't know if it'll work yet. But if you go into accelerators these days, or particularly things like free electron lasers, the wigglers are made with permanent magnets. And if you go into hobby stores, you can buy a neodymium iron boron magnets, which have an, a remnant field of 1.4 tesla. Really quite a large field. And people have put them together in configurations which are called Halbach configurations and made 4.7 tesla fields just with permanent magnets. No cryogens, no electricity, a much, much simpler way to make magnetic fields. Right? In fact, if you, this is a nice undergraduate problem. Ask the question, you take a, a, a spherical system, inner radius of R1, outer radius of R2, make the largest field you can at R equals zero, and the formula for the maximum field you can make has a logarithmic divergence as you make this thing bigger and bigger and bigger. So you can make very large fields if you arrange your magnets in a certain way. Right? And these configurations are sort of called Halbach configurations. These magnets have quite interesting properties. Um, they stay magnetized. This is called the coercivity. If you take them down below zero to temperatures like 100 to 150 degrees, right up to 7 teslas. So they'll stay magnetized. In, in, a, in a strong field right up to that level. So the quit, and, and there's a new set of, um, of permanent magnet materials, iron nitrite, which remnant fields of around 2.5 tesla in there. So almost doubling the available field strength you can get from permanent magnets. So is it, is it ridiculous to start to think of making fusion devices with permanent magnets? Um, well, you can't make a toroidal field with a permanent magnet. Because if you think about it, if you take an integral of h dot dl around the loop, that must be the free current going through the loop. And so if you have a field going around the loop, you've got to have some free current going through that loop. But you might imagine making a machine in which that field is produced by a simple set of coils, and all the shaping field is produced by a set of permanent magnets. Um, and indeed, we've made such, well, we haven't made the configurations, we've made them on the computer. Um, taking a basic set of simple coils going around and a layer of uh, the neodymium magnets on the outside of the vacuum vessel, we were able to make these exotic configurations. Right? And so this is very simple because you can imagine uh, making that configuration by putting this layer of permanent magnet around the outside, it's demountable. You can take it away. You can reuse it. You can, uh, you can structure it. But we don't know all that much about it. And this was actually a configuration Matt Landerman at Maryland made, um, which would reproduce one of the more promising configurations that we have. This one is a configuration that has been suggested um, by the Max Planck Institute that they might make. This is called Estelle. But this was making the same configuration that they made with superconducting magnets, but with simple magnets and uh, permanent magnets. But I always like to challenge the audience. We really don't know how much field you can make in these complex situations. 
we, we took the computer and we just put magnetic fields and adjusted them until we got the field that we wanted at every point by optimization on the, on the, on the computer. But there ought to be some theorems in this. Imagine you have a plasma in a torus which has some funny shape. You know what that shape wants to be. What's the configuration of permanent magnets that you have to put around it? And it's obviously not unique. Maybe you have a volume. You say you want to fill that with permanent magnet. It's obviously not unique because you, the, the volume current from the permanent magnets is the curl of M, and the surface currents is N cross M. If you made this gauge transformation um, and found a function phi, any function phi, it wouldn't change the field. Right? So our problem is the maximum value of M is fixed by the materials. But what we want is a maximum value of B. So if you can find a way and an algorithm that we can find the best possible configuration of permanent magnets to get the maximum possible field in the device, write me and, and I'll put my name on your paper. <laughs> um, so we're, we're working on this at the moment. Um, but the idea is to look for a lower field solution that will scale to a pilot plant, something that will allow us to get there. And the Department of Energy has just agreed to fund building one of these permanent magnet arrays to demonstrate that we can do the technology. And we're hoping to actually build a stellarator out of it maybe two or three years down the road from now. I'm not going to go into this. I'm going to get to my final slide. Perhaps permanent magnets, and because they'll be evolving over the next 10, 15 years to higher and higher fields, um, may be an option to reduce the cost of fusion reactors. Um, if you can prove some of these theorems, it would be an awful big help in getting us there. Um, I believe that fusion does have a role to play in our energy future. Um, and I hope we get there quickly. And I hope you enjoyed my talk. Thank you very much. Are you abandoning it now because you want a version that uses uh, permanent magnets So, um, NCSX was a Princeton machine that never got... Sorry, where is it? It's right here. That machine. Okay, NCSX was a machine that was never built at Princeton because we failed to be able to build, within a reasonable cost, these curly magnet uh, coils right there. Um, but we did build these coils and the vacuum vessel. So the proposal to the DOE is to take the vacuum vessel and the planar coils and permanent magnets and make the first permanent magnet stellarator with that. Um, but it won't be the NCSX configuration because we've just had a bunch of funding from the Simons Foundation to find new configurations and we have a better one. Um, so the one thing that's prob permanent magnets will give you a field. That's it. You won't be able to adjust it because you can't change the current. Um, so you get one configuration. Um, you can move them around, but you can't move them around during a shot. Um, <laughs> so we'll start with what we think is the best configuration. The other nice thing about them is that we're aiming in an engineering sense to be able to make them adjustable so that we can get precision, not by building in precision, but by adjusting to precision. Um, How do you see the role of computers in uh, searching for configurations which are uh, unexpected or uh, not? Um, this? Yeah, so the, the codes that produce this configuration here um, are a product of this funding we got from the Simons Foundation of New York. Um, this is the hedge fund manager, Jim Simons, who's funding a lot of American physics these days. Um, and he's funded us to build a set of tools to optimize, to look for um, three-dimensional configurations that have certain properties. 
Um, and so one of the things here is these configurations are enormously difficult to build unless we use the permanent magnets. And so we're trying to look at the whole thing as a massive optimization problem um, to find the best configuration we can build. But it would sure help if we had a few mathematical theorems to hang our hat on. You will need to have some holes in this beautiful structure. Isn't it going to destroy this beautiful quasi-symmetry or nice property? So um, we looked at that, actually. Um, Matt Landerman took, um, this is the configuration without holes, but he put ports in at various points around it. And he found he could just adjust the magnets elsewhere to, to make up for the holes. So it's possible to put holes in. Obviously, you can't put huge holes in, but, but you can put holes that are big enough. Uh, do you think your fusion should be making the same cap, uh, venture capital venture investments that are happening in the US? Um, do I think we should get more money for fusion? Uh, <laughs> obviously, I do. Yeah, obviously, I do. Um, it, it, you know, dealing with venture capitalists in fusion is very interesting because the time scale, the realistic time scale to fusion is beyond the five-year horizon of most venture capitalists. And it's beyond the 10-year horizon of the most optimistic venture capitalists. So when you look at venture capital money in fusion, you should really call it philanthropy. Um, and, that, and, and some of the people who are putting their private money in fusion understand that that's what they're doing. I'm not sure that all of them do, but, 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 but some of them do. Um, and, and I think that's terrific because those people are understanding that uh, having fusion as a power source would be very important in the future and that they have lots of money and to them this isn't a lot of money. I mean, um, Paul Allen uh, gave money to TriAlpha, which is the company trying to do proton boron fusion. Um, and so... You know, it should be encouraged. In, in, in Jim Simons's case, he's a guy who spent his life doing algorithms, originally to crack Russian codes, and then in a math department at Stony Brook, and then for a hedge fund that's the most profitable hedge fund in the world. Um, and so when he looked at the problem of how do you optimize configurations, he said, oh, I'll spend some money on that. But he sees it as philanthropy. He, he's, he's not expecting to get a payback from Fusion. Um, he just thinks that we ought to investigate using modern optimization tools, configurations in fusion. So you don't see leverage IP as something that you can offer to investors? Well, the, I mean, this is interesting because the, uh, people suggest that the biotech model, which is often m much more than five years away from a product, uh, might be uh, the, the right model where the venture capitalists basically are investing up to the point at which they get the IP, and then they sell the IP for the next stage. Um, and there is some talk of that. To be honest, I'm the wrong person to ask about it. Um, so I'm just burbling at this point. Yeah. I'm sorry, at the very beginning, you said that you were competing to get to the set of sustainability. A long time ago, it was a simulation because it was beyond successful, but it still was a set of Scan number three. Yeah, well, you know, honestly, scan number three, I would declare a huge success. If, if I'm sitting in the ETA control room and I only get 300, ETA has said it's going to get 500 megawatts of fusion power. But if it got 300 megawatts and that was self-sustained, I think we would, we would declare victory um, at that point. The scan that would be really disappointing would be scan one uh, or scan four when it gets uh, polluted by buildup of helium ash. I wonder if, if whether radiation harvest would be a problem for the pilot and magnets. So. so this is interesting. One of the reasons I would like to go to, to um, a lower power density option and make cheap but big is that the lifetime of the wall in, in, helium, uh, in, in neutrons damage to the wall depends on how many neutrons cross the wall per year. And uh, typically, 10, 10 megawatts per square meter on the wall, sorry, one megawatt per square meter on the wall causes every atom in the wall to be displaced 10 times in a year. Right? So imagine shaking up all your atoms in the wall 10 times a year. And typically, in these high-field devices, like the MIT one, which is being proposed, 
they're talking five megawatts per square meter on the wall, which means every atom in the wall is displaced 50 times in a year. And we can't guarantee that, that steels will survive that. So when you go to low power density, what you can do is that it will survive long enough that you can then replace the wall on a reasonable time scale. Um, now, the, the radiation hardness of, um, of neodymium is a problem. So the, the permanent magnets will be, have to be behind a bit of a shield, but they will naturally be behind what's called the blanket. So that they'll already be somewhat shielded um, by the time you get there. And we are doing some calculations right now to find out you know, what's the lifetime of a permanent magnet in that radiation flux. Iron nitrogen, on the other hand, is probably much better. The problem is neodymium produces a long-lived radioisotope, which we don't want to have. Um, whereas iron nitrogen produces no long-lived radioisotopes and therefore would be much preferable. But this is a problem fusion always has because you have to shield the, the superconducting magnets from the neutrons because otherwise you get quenches and you get destruction of the superconducting magnets. So we are planning to shield magnets anyway. Um, but at the moment, I don't really know the answer. And if anybody in the audience has tried putting permanent magnets in a, in a neutron flux and see how long they stay a permanent magnet, please tell me. So we started by saying that the problem that we face, and I'm so question that people ask until fusion is always 30 years away. And uh, if uh, we pursue the way of the accelerators, how long do you think that, that number would change? Thank you for this question. <laughs> um, uh, I think a lot of the a lot of the developments that have made ETA possible, et cetera, mean that um, developments in stellarators may be faster than we did when we were doing tokamaks. I think giving unrealistic projections of the time to, to fusion damages the program, not just reputational damage. It means that you're, you're doing things without realizing that you, you've got time to get the solution right. Um, so I, I'm a bit concerned that you know, we, we get really bushy-tailed and think we've solved a bunch of problems that we haven't solved, and, and we rush and, and tell everybody we've got a solution that we haven't got um, in this context. And that's my way of avoiding your question, really. Therefore, we've got the next question. It's along the same lines. Um, now with venture capital, are people selling fusion more often to get the money? Um, so there's been a, a billion in venture capital investment in fusion in the last five years in the US. It's a lot of money. Um, I can't guarantee that everybody who's talking to those venture capitalists was selling fusion how I would. Um, I think that uh, you have a difficulty that you're Investors want you to give them a time scale that's a bit shorter than you perhaps re realistically can predict. Um, but I think what is also pleasing is that I know that some of these people are not thinking of investment. They're not really venture capitalists. They're just philanthropists, right? And they think fusion's important enough that they should give some of their private money to them. Um, so I think in the case of Tri-Alpha, for instance, I think probably at least 50% of the money comes that way. And I think also in, in terms of MIT. Yeah. Okay, just at the very, very beginning, you talked about uh, deuterium. How do we get it like, naturally? Is there a oh, there's uh, one part in 4,000 of the hydrogen in seawater is deuterium. So you can separate it from, from seawater in a number of different ways. Um, of course, uh, we've known since the Second World War how to get deuterium out of seawater um, and uh, to make heavy water reactors and things like that. Um, so, uh, yes, it, and, and it is so much deuterium in seawater that you never worry about the abundance of, of deuterium. Um, and the, the, the lithium uh, separation from seawater has taken a, a, a good step forward in the last couple of years because there are membrane processes for getting lithium out of seawater. At the moment, it's not cheap enough that your laptop battery uh, comes from lithium from seawater. It comes from lithium, from lithium carbonate from the high Andean deserts where it's in salty brines. Um, but eventually, I think we will figure out how to extract lithium from seawater at an incredibly low cost. But for fusion, because it's so intensely power dense, dense 
the, the restriction on the cost of extracting the lithium is really very loose. It, it seems quite possible. Yeah. One last question. Um, do you think by uh, promoting nuclear fusion, it takes sometimes the, the risk to, to unpromote nuclear fusion, that people have uh, a bad view of nuclear fusion? <laughs> Could you get rid of that questioner and that question? <laughs> no, 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 absolutely. Yeah, but, you know, I, I ran the um, UK's Atomic Energy uh, Authority for a time, which um, a good proportion of my job was running the fusion program, but about half my job was um, running a bunch of old fission issues um, in the UK. And I am of the view that if you're going to try and decarbonize by 2050, which I think we should do, uh, then you're going to have to do some fission. Um, and that we know how to do it, and we should do it. And the date and the uh, any problems that you might imagine fission have are dwarfed by the problems of climate change, right? And um, I would argue fission is very safe. We know how to deal with the waste. We know all those things. But you can ignore my arguments and just look at the relative benefit of doing fission or having climate change. And I think that you know we, we're going to have to do some fission between now and then. And I'm very disappointed that um, several countries in Europe have abandoned uh, fission. Um, yeah, I'm really being impolite now um, uh, in politics. <laughs> because I think we, we have an opportunity um, of combining fission and renewables and making a zero carbon energy economy in Europe. Um, the combination of uh, cheap renewables, um, some sin fuel production, fission, um, uh, hydro storage um, and uh, batteries for peak loads, etc. And I think we can actually do it. I mean, it, it's, it's possible to do it. It's not impossible at all. And then fission, it's replacing those fission stations that fusion will come in. And fusion fits into the gap, as it were, that fission would, would take. I don't think we want to do fission long term um, because I think eventually... You know, we run out of cheap uranium and we, we, we produce probably more waste than we really want to handle. Um, but long, that's a centuries time scale, not a millennial time scale, I think we'll be doing fission for. Um, so I'm convinced that we should do that and I hope that none of my arguments for fusion mean people will abandon the idea that we really should be doing some fission. Thank you. I think it's time we thank Professor Steve Cowley again and we go to the other